this morning, we are beginning a new series titled Gifted. And we're not talking about IQs or child prodigies or some special class of elite performers. We're talking about God's gift of the Holy Spirit to us. On one occasion, Jesus told his followers this. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now this morning, we're going to put our focus on the power to live a new life. The power to live a new life. Let's pause a moment and pray. Lord God, we love you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for being present with us in the person of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray that you would work inside of us today, that by your Holy Spirit you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to believe all that you want to speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Almost everyone I know is looking for a change. In fact, in just a couple of months, something like 150 million American adults will make New Year's resolutions. Now, studies show that almost nobody keeps them, but we still like making them. Now, do you know what the most popular New Year's resolutions are? I feel a game of family feud coming on here just for a moment. What do you, what do you think? What are some of the most popular resolutions? Lose weight. Yes. Huge one. What else? That was it. <laughs> Any other ideas? Exercise. Yes. Save money. Huge one. In fact, here are the top ten. According to Inc.com, diet or eat healthier, exercise more, lose weight. Kind of feel like those are all in the same category a little bit. Save more and spend less. Yes. Help me, Jesus. Learn a new skill or hobby. Quit smoking, read more, find another job, drink less alcohol, spend more time with family and friends. Now, these are all great. I actually kind of feel like there are a few gaps, though. I mean, nobody wants to spend less time on their phone, maybe a little. Nobody wants to cut back on Netflix. I think there are a few gaps. Now, beyond our personal lives, most people I know want to change in the world. I mean, we have political concerns or environmental concerns or justice concerns. We're concerned about the economy or health care or maybe international conflicts and on and on. We want to change in our lives as we live in this world. Now, this is nothing new. People in the ancient world were longing for a change as well. And the Jews in Jesus' day captured this hope that they had for change with one very pregnant phrase, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. In fact, to understand just how radical the things that Jesus said and did were, we need to understand something about how his contemporaries understood this phrase. Now, the Jewish people had a view of deity that varied significantly from the pagan peoples around them. See, the pagan peoples around them believed that their world was uncertain because the deities were uncertain. I mean, you could never really be totally sure what they wanted from you. And if you didn't honor them properly, then things could go really badly for you as an individual or maybe your family or maybe your whole people. And so the world was unpredictable because the gods were unpredictable predictable. Now, the Jews, on the other hand, believed just the opposite. They believed that because of their sins, God had handed them over. And because, practically speaking, God was not king in Israel, things were not going well for them. And in fact, the entire world was out of sorts. But their hope was that one day the kingdom of God would come and everything would be changed. In fact, their pagan oppressors would finally be crushed. An anointed king in the line of David would finally be on the throne again. The temple would be cleaned and restored. A proper priesthood would be reestablished. Finally, there would be pure worship once again. In fact, God himself would come and dwell with his people, and they would live in peace and prosperity. The people of Israel were longing for a change, and that change was captured by this phrase, the kingdom of God. 
Now, with that in mind, I want to look at a very fascinating exchange that took place between Jesus and his disciples shortly before his ascension into heaven. We read about it in Acts 1. After Jesus' suffering, he presented himself to the apostles and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, don't miss this. The apostles, just like everybody else in Israel, were longing for a change. And this change was captured by this phrase, the kingdom of God. And so Jesus talks to them about the kingdom and about his purposes for Israel. And then he refocuses their attention on the Holy Spirit. In other words, what he's saying to them is, yes, my kingdom is advancing, but the way that change is going to come in your lives and in the world in this moment in history, the way the kingdom is going to be advanced is through the power of my Holy Spirit. Now, this big idea actually emerged on a number of occasions throughout Jesus' public ministry. In John chapter 3, a man named Nicodemus, who was a well-known Jewish teacher in Israel, came to Jesus secretly at night. This is what they said. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. See, Jesus knew that Nicodemus wanted to talk about the kingdom of God. That's what everybody was talking about. And the kingdom of God meant revolution and restoration of the temple and the return of Yahweh to Israel. And so this is what he wants to talk about. And Jesus takes the conversation in a surprising direction. Jesus tells them, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. Now, Nicodemus wasn't quite ready for this. How can someone be born when they are old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Nicodemus wants to talk about the kingdom, and Jesus turns the conversation to the Holy Spirit. In other words, Nicodemus, like everyone else around him, was looking for the kingdom of God to come and to produce a change out there. And Jesus says it really all begins with a spirit-empowered change in here. God wants to birth something new in you, Nicodemus, by his Holy Spirit. Now, before we get too far ahead of ourselves, we need to address a couple of questions that are lurking in the background. Number one, who or what is the Holy Spirit? Who or what is the Holy Spirit? And number two, why do we need to change? Why do we need to change? Let's take these questions in order. Who or what is the Holy Spirit? Jesus describes the person and work of the Holy Spirit in a really significant conversation that took place with his disciples the day before he went to the cross. We read this. If you love me, Keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear, but when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. 
All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. What we find here is that the Holy Spirit is a divine person who is one with the Father and with the Son, and yet distinguishable from each of them in some important sense. Now, eventually, the Christians would formulate the doctrine of the Trinity, which would help them to put into words what they had experienced in Jesus' life and in Jesus' teaching about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, notice this. The Holy Spirit is not an impersonal force. He is a person. In fact, Jesus says, I have been your advocate, but I'm going to give you another advocate who will be with you forever. In other words, the Holy Spirit would continue the work that Jesus had been doing in the lives of the disciples. Now, I want you to notice some of the parallels that Jesus himself makes between what he was doing and what the Holy Spirit would do. We find the following. They're both sent by the Father. The Holy Spirit will be with and in the disciples just as Jesus had been with the disciples and would be in them. Many in the world will not know or receive the Holy Spirit just as many had not known or received Jesus. The Holy Spirit will teach the disciples just as Jesus had taught the disciples. The Holy Spirit will give testimony just as Jesus had given testimony. The Holy Spirit will convict the world just as Jesus had convicted the world. The Holy Spirit will lead people into truth just as Jesus had led people into truth. And the Holy Spirit would be their advocate just as Jesus had been their advocate. The Holy Spirit, then, is the one who continues the work of Jesus in the world and in our lives. It's the Holy Spirit who brings the power for transformation. Now, to our second question. Why do we need to change? Why do we need to change? Well, the Apostle Paul actually writes something very profound in his letter to the Ephesians. And what he says is that each of our lives are actually directed by three major forces. One of these is external, one of them is internal, and one is immaterial. Listen to what he writes. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. By default, Paul explains, our behavior is driven by three major forces. Number one, the world. This is a reference to the cultures, the systems, the structures, the societies in which all of us live. Then he talks about the flesh. This is that self-focused, self-gratifying, sometimes even animalistic drive, these impulses that all of us feel. And then he talks about the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Now, this is an immaterial force that many of us are not used to thinking about. And Paul is referencing here Satan and, by extension, other demons who are in rebellion against God and who want to destroy our lives. Now, these three forces dominate our behavior from birth. I mean, our inherently selfish and self-focused natures are further shaped by the culture and the different social structures that we inhabit, and even by unseen demonic forces who manipulate both systems and individuals. None of us are immune from these three forces. Now, these forces are active in the present, and they were active in the ancient world. So how did ancient Israel deal with these? How do they respond to the world and the flesh in this ruler of the kingdom of the air? Well, number one, by trusting God to fight physical battles on their behalf against the surrounding nations that threaten to dominate them. 
Number two, through committing their lives to the Torah, that is the law of Moses. And number three, by having a specific form of war. Again, any sort of war was ultimately seen as a spiritual conflict. Now, as I said, this was a temporary measure. Ultimately, God's desire was to bring blessings to all the nations through the people of Israel. But in that stage in history, that's how God protected the Israelites from the dominating cultures of the world around them. Similarly, God gave Israel a very specific form of worship centered around the temple in Jerusalem. He gave them sacred space and priests in a way to, to perform sacrifices that would distinguish them from the pagan worship of those various deities of the peoples around them. This was to protect them from idolatry. And thirdly, he gave them the Torah, the teaching, the law of Moses. This was supposed to help them overcome the evil impulse that drives all of our lives. Now, as we mentioned several times already, all of these were preparatory. They were temporary measures intended to keep things in check for the moment. But the real change that all of us need wouldn't ultimately come about until God poured out his Holy Spirit on his people. Now, we obviously are not ancient Israelites, but we've got our various strategies for producing change in our own lives as well. For example, we buy stuff. Have you ever bought something that you thought was going to change your life, only to discover nothing really changed at all? So I've got this Apple Watch. It's kind of cool. Cost me a few hundred dollars. Thought it was going to revolutionize my life. The power of Apple on my wrist everywhere I go. Well, I can tell time. I can see what my heart rate is, because that's really important all throughout the day. Didn't really change my life at all. Last Christmas, we got an Instant Pot. Anybody have an Instant Pot? Oh, our friends told us, your family will never eat the same again. Your life's going to be totally different. Our Instant Pot has been on the shelf for, let's just say, more than an instant. Right? It's just been hanging out there for a long time. Hasn't changed our lives at all. And we've got other strategies, too. We try to educate ourselves. Now, I love to learn. Anybody like to watch TED Talks, listen to podcasts, read books? Man, I love all of that. But you know when I'm honest with myself? Do you know how much of what I read or listen to I actually incorporate into my real life? Almost nothing. <laughs> so I love to learn, but practically most of the time it doesn't change me very much. Some of us like to study our personalities. Anybody into the Enneagram? Oh, man, yeah. Some of you are like, yeah, I'm a three. I'm a five, right? I, I love Myers-Briggs and Strengths Finder and Enneagram and all. I think it's all really interesting and fascinating. But, you know, most of the time we don't really use it to change ourselves. We use it to justify ourselves. I'm an introvert, so I can't talk to you anymore. I'm sorry. <laughs> Going home now. Right? Or we use it to put other people in a box. Oh, you're an Enneagram eight. That's why you're a domineering control freak. I get it. Now I understand. And, of course, we've got all kinds of other strategies for change. New job, new relationship, new apartment, new roommate, perhaps, new diet, new look. So we've got all these various strategies. But here's the thing. None of them have the power to overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. We need something that goes way deeper than that. We need God's Holy Spirit who can make us new. Now, the ancient prophet Ezekiel recognized this as God spoke to them. And listen to what Ezekiel said as he prophesied what God was saying to Israel. For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. That is a malleable, soft heart toward God. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors, you will be my people, and I will be your God. Now, the Apostle Paul also recognized that the law of Moses, though it was revelation from God, didn't actually contain within it the power to overcome sin in his own life. And so he writes this to the Romans. 
We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am who... Who will rescue me? Do you know the merely moralistic man or woman will eventually become desperate? They'll eventually become desperate. See, the human will alone is not strong enough to suppress the flesh. And this is why eventually many religious people become angry people. Sometimes they become violent people. Sometimes they have major moral failures. Fake it till you make it only works for so long. Eventually, we need real change on the inside of us. Now, Paul tells us where to find this change in the next chapter in Romans. Here's what he writes. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Jesus became one of us. He lived in flesh like ours. And then he took the condemnation due us in his body when he died on the cross. And then he poured out his Holy Spirit on us to empower us how God has always wanted us to live. Friends, it's the Holy Spirit who makes us new and empowers us to live a new life. Now, let's take a moment to unpack this. How does the Holy Spirit do this? Well, number one, whenever we make a commitment to follow Jesus Christ and to be baptized in water, God makes us new. Whenever we make a commitment to follow Jesus Christ and be baptized in water, the Holy Spirit makes us new. Now, the biblical authors employ a variety of metaphors to describe this major transformation that happens on the inside of us. As we saw already, the scriptures speak of being born again, or being set free, or being washed, or being sanctified, or dying to the old life, or the new creation coming. I remember when I first began asking God to come change my life. I was working as a sandwich artist at a Subway restaurant while I was in college. Pretty glorious job. I often had the graveyard shift, which means I had to shut everything down by myself at night, mopping all the floors, cleaning everything. And I can remember getting to a place in my life when I realized I need something to change. I need something to change. Have you ever been in that spot? We just realized something has got to change. And it wasn't even my external circumstances. It was things going on in my own soul. And so for the first time in my life, I began to pray very honest prayers. God, I need you to come change my life. I need you to come change my life. Now, I really had no expectation about what would happen. Honestly, I was a little bit skeptical that anything at all would happen. But to my surprise, God answered those prayers and transformation began to happen on the inside in what I valued and what I thought about during the day, how I spent my time. All of that began to change. You know, I remember experiencing pretty significant change in two major areas. Number one, the way that I viewed and related to the women around me. And number two, the way I related to those people whom I called friends. Now, this all took place when I was a guy in college. You don't have to use your, much of an imagination to understand how I was thinking about the women around me uh, when I was in college. Like a lot of other guys, I primarily evaluated the women around me by what I thought they could do for me sexually. And so I decided whether I wanted to spend time with them or not spend time with them based on that sort of filter. It was pathetic. 
But that's where I was in my life at that time. But when I asked God to change me, I didn't even pray specifically about that. God began to revolutionize how I thought about the women around me. I began to see them differently and respect them and think about them differently. And then my friendships. Now, for me, I don't know about you, but growing up, my friendships were honestly pretty utilitarian or filled with competitiveness, right? I wanted to see if I could be better than you. Or maybe I just wanted to use you for entertainment in my life. And so, yeah, I liked my friends, but honestly, I didn't have real love in my heart toward these people I had been calling friends. And when I asked God to change my life, it's one of the major things that shifted on the inside of me. For the first time, I began to genuinely love the people around me, caring about what happened in their lives, honestly celebrating when great things happen for them and wanting to see the best for them. God produces change on the inside of us when we make a commitment to follow Jesus Christ. This Christian faith is so much more than just a religion or just committing ourselves to a set of morals. Being a moral person can never bring about the depth of change that God wants to bring about by his Holy Spirit. This is why Jesus told Nicodemus, No one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. Now, number two, the Holy Spirit leads us in our daily lives. He leads us in our daily lives. Have you ever called like your bank or an insurance company because you need a question answered? And the next thing you know, you're just lost in a maze of menus and sub menus and main menus. Ever had that terrible experience? I don't know about you, but it feels like every single time I call, I'm told, listen carefully to our menu items as our menu has recently changed. Do you change this every week? What is going on? Right? And so you're just pressing buttons and, you know, slowly you're just getting angrier and angrier. Can I just talk to a person? Can I talk to a person? Well, friends, God has not just given us endless rules or principles or complicated flow charts and then just said, good luck. Hope it works out for you in life. No, he has given us his personal presence in the person of the Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us. You know, at its core, the Christian faith is not a collection of rules. It's a relationship. It's a relationship. In fact, when Jesus told his disciples the night before he would go to the cross that he was about to leave, this brought about a major crisis for them. I mean, Jesus was their hero. He was their friend. He was their king. He was the one that they looked to to be led. Jesus taught them and comforted them and healed them and directed them. What in the world were they going to do when Jesus left them? Well, here's what Jesus told them. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. The Holy Spirit empowers us moment by moment to do the will of God. The Holy Spirit leads us. The Holy Spirit helps us pray. In fact, the Holy Spirit reminds us who we are. Paul wrote this to the Romans. The spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, for all these reasons, when the believers in Galatia started looking again to the law of Moses to direct them in their lives, the Apostle Paul responded strongly. Here's what he wrote. Who has bewitched you? Are you so foolish after beginning by means of the spirit? Are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? In other words, this Christian life is a life led by, directed by, filled with the Holy Spirit. In fact, in Galatians chapter 5, just a couple of chapters later, Paul will use all of the following phrases. Living by the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, walking by the Spirit, keeping in step 
with the Spirit, sowing to the Spirit, and producing the fruit of the Spirit. See, living a changed life is first and foremost not about discovering one more life hack. It's about being led every single day by God's Holy Spirit. I already mentioned to you that when God's Spirit began to make me new on the inside, one of the major changes was how I started loving these people whom I had called friends. And I remember very distinctly one day I was working in the computer lab. And while I was working, I began to get this overwhelming sense of thanksgiving and gratitude for a friend of mine who would eventually become the best man in my wedding. And I started to just get filled with joy as I thought about his friendship. And I had the thought, I'm going to call my friend and encourage him. Now, you've got to understand, at this point in my life, I never did anything like that. That was way outside of normal procedure. So I call up my friend, and I begin telling him how thankful I am for him. And I start encouraging him. And the next thing I know, he is crying on the other end of the line. Now, we never did that. We didn't cry around each other. We were dudes. We were way too cool for that. But he's crying because what I didn't know is that he had just gone through a very, very difficult and painful relational loss. And the dark clouds had started rolling in and were threatening him, threatening to just swallow him up. And God's spirit started working in my heart to pick up the phone and call my friend. Friends, when you start living a life led by the Holy Spirit, things get very exciting. Anything can happen when we start listening to the Spirit of God. It's not about more rules, more principles, more life hacks. The Holy Spirit will lead us and direct us in this life. Christian life is not just a set of rules to live this moralism. It's about being transformed by the Spirit. And led by the Spirit in all that we do. Number three, the Holy Spirit empowers us to engage the world. Now, we're going to say a lot more about this in the coming weeks, but I want to just mention a couple of things here. As we saw already, the Jews of Jesus' day were anticipating a political and military revolution. And Jesus often warned them about taking this path. But eventually, the Jewish leadership decided to take it anyway. And in 70 AD, they were just overwhelmed and experienced a crushing defeat at the hands of the Romans. But as we saw earlier in Acts 1, Jesus actually redirected these ideas about the kingdom of God to the Holy Spirit. Here's what he said. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And what Jesus is saying here is you're not to be afraid of the world. You're not to fight against the world. You're not to isolate yourself from the world and you're not to just blend in with the world. Instead, you're to take the life of Jesus Christ everywhere you go by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit who shows us how to engage the world. Now, practically speaking, this will often mean that God will lead us to respond to others in a very different way from how they have acted toward us. Paul explains in his letter to the Romans, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Do not take revenge. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. Do not overcome by evil. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now we see a very practical way of how this was played out in the early church. Peter and John are proclaiming the message about Jesus in the temple courts. And very quickly, the Jewish authorities shut it down and throw them in prison. And they're not quite sure what to do with Peter and John. And so after a lot of discussion, they bring Peter and John out. They give them some very strong threats, and then they release them. Now, how did they respond? What did Peter and John do? What did the early church do? Well, the book of Acts tells us they prayed They prayed, and listen closely to what they prayed. 
Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Now, notice this. They are being threatened by the Jewish leadership. So what's their response? They say, God, empower us by your Holy Spirit to do good to them, to heal them, to help set them free, to bring the message of Jesus to them. It wasn't that I'm going to attack them or hide from them or isolate myself from them or just blend in with them. God, empower us to bring the life of Jesus to them, to be a blessing to them. The Holy Spirit teaches us how to engage the world. Friends, God has changed for us. He is transformation for us. And it begins with His Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, we worship you in this place. Lord, there's no one like you. Lord, we recognize today our need for your Holy Spirit. Lord, we don't want to try to live this life out of the flesh, out of our own cleverness, just my white knuckling it a little longer. God, we want your Holy Spirit. Just while in this moment of prayer, maybe you're here today and you're thinking to yourself, I need God. I need God. I know I've been living life my own way, and I need his forgiveness. I want his purpose. I want his Holy Spirit to work in my life. I want his freedom. I want his joy. If that's you today, I want to encourage you to take a very simple step right where you are. To take a moment to grab one of the cards and the seat backs in front of you and to fill it out. And on the back of that card to indicate today, I am making a commitment to follow Jesus Christ. Maybe you want to write down a prayer request. Father, I thank you. And when we take these simple steps, Lord, you make things new. Lord, as your word says, flesh gives birth to flesh, but your Holy Spirit gives birth to spirit. Lord, will you freshly fill us today? Will you lead us by your Holy Spirit today? Will you give us ears to hear what you want to say to us by your Holy Spirit? Lord, make us sensitive. God, open up stopped ears. Help us to hear. Fill our hearts with your presence, Lord, that we can love you and love the people around us. Make us new today is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we give God praise, church?